Hello, this is Fred Haight, and welcome to a tutorial called How to Tell Bach from a Computer. Before I start talking, let's just plunge in and listen to a little bit of the music. For time reasons, we can't listen to an entire Bach fugue, so what we're going to listen to is what is sometimes called the exposition of a fugue written by Bach, and then we're going to listen to the exposition of a fugue written by a computer program called Emmy. If you have trouble identifying the difference, that's perfectly okay. If you don't have trouble identifying the difference, then you're a lot smarter than me and you may not need to listen to this seminar. I think the right learning curve is if we start out having trouble identifying the difference and then through a process of walking through the fugue, by the end of it you say, well, of course I hear the difference. How could I have ever missed it? Now, if you are one of those people who was smart enough to hear the difference right away, then you would have picked up that I played a little trick on you. I led you to believe that I was going to start with the Bach fugue and then play the Emmy computer fugue when I actually reversed it. I started with the computer fugue and the second one that you heard was actually Bach. Though it was played by a computer generated MIDI tone imitating an organ. One of the problems, one of the difficulties in telling the difference between Bach and a computer these days as that people often play Bach as though he were a computer. The advocates of artificial intelligence, the people who wish to prove that a computer can compose like Bach, have a big problem. There's a huge gulf between a computer and Bach. How do you bridge that gulf? Well, it may be easier to try to bring Bach closer to being a computer than to bring a computer closer to being Bach. Curiously, this process is aided by the most unlikely allies of the advocates of artificial intelligence, the hippies. What do I mean by hippie? There is something called the HIP movement, H-I-P, Historically Informed Performances. These are the people that do painstaking research into what they call period practices. They look at what were the instruments like at the time? What were the performance procedures like at the time? What tempo did they play at? What tuning did they use? How did they bow? How much vibrato did they use in the voice, etc., etc.? And they produce recordings which they say reproduce the music much closer to how it would have been played in Bach's time. One might expect the most thrilling, powerful, and beautiful performances of Bach you had ever heard. Yet, Again, curiously, often, not always, but often, they result in the most 
dry, mechanical, vibrato-less, unvocal, and emotionally puny performances. Much like a computer. And that is not an historically informed performance. There were no computers in Bach's time. Both of the mistaken efforts to turn Bach into a computer and turn a computer into Bach derive from a common false axiomatic assumption. How often have you heard it said, Bach is the most mathematical of composers? This characterization persists, even though no less of an authority than Bach's son, Emmanuel, wrote to his father's first biographer, Forkel, quote, the deceased like myself or any other true musician, was no lover of dry mathematical stuff. In composition, he always proceeded straight to what was practical and omitted the dry species counterpoint as given out by Fuchs and others. That's a quote from Bach's son, Emmanuel. Notice how dry mathematical stuff and dry species counterpoint are identified as similar. The types of dry counterpoint that Emmanuel Bach cites tend to regard notes and intervals as abstract and viewed according to their relations uh, between each other and with no regard to their actual physical means of production. Computer generated performances tend to suffer from a similar problem. The tones produced by a MIDI performance are about as close to disembodied counterpoint as you're going to get. No vibrato, no qualities of vocal registration. I don't think anyone would ever mistake the MIDI tone for a highly trained opera singer. The idea of Bach's music as being mathematical and the idea of his music being disembodied counterpoint are closely related. To this day, there are experts who believe that Bach's art of the fugue is a contrapuntal exercise on paper and was never meant to be performed by any combination of real instruments or voices. When Pablo Cassells discovered Bach's suites for solo cello and revived them as performance pieces, he horrified some German counterpoint professors who knew the suites but thought of them as abstract exercises in counterpoint and believed they were never meant to be played, certainly not with the type of articulation that Cassells used, which imbued them with every type of human emotion. Cassells lamented, they tried to turn Bach into a professor. Turning Bach into a professor and turning him into a computer is only a matter of a few decades difference. Lest you get the wrong idea of my intent, I will pose to you right now what might seem like a paradox. Bach was not a mathematical composer. He was, however, a scientific composer. Let us listen to another exposition of this Bach fugue, and it is the Fugue in B-flat minor from Book One of the Well-Tempered Clavier. This time it is a recording made probably 70 years ago by Edwin Fisher on the piano. You may notice this time that the exposition of the fugue features five voices, not four. I must add that an Edwin Fisher or a Willem Furtwängler would not be allowed to play Bach the way they did these days. They'd be run off the stage. 
by the hippies who would say, oh, that's a hopelessly romantic 19th century interpretation of Bach that goes completely at odds with all the historical evidence of how it was actually performed. Yet, the most powerful and compelling evidence, which the hip people often ignore, is what's in the score itself. I'm not talking about period practice reading of scores and terms of articulation and things like that. I'm talking about the power of ideas in the score. Edwin Fisher is not imposing 19th century romantic notions upon Bach's score. He's simply finding what's in there. But to do that, you have to realize one thing. Bach's music, including his keyboard music, is always extremely vocal. You could take most of the fugues in the well-tempered clavier and arrange them for a vocal quartet or quintet as needs be and find just how beautifully they come out, not only according to the range of the voice but the registral qualities of the human voice. And discover riches difficult to find simply sitting at the keyboard and playing. The best type of keyboard playing is by players who have studied Bach's vocal music, not in the hip way, but in its full power, and hear that quality in their mind's eye and seek to replicate it within the limitations of their instrument. Are any of the qualities of the human voice, other than perhaps their range, programmed into Emmy's fugue writing program? I doubt it. Fortunately today, we have a few precious artists who have fought to resist the tide of both computerized composition and historically informed performances. A task much more difficult than you might think. Listen to a recent performance of the same fugue introduction by Andras Schiff, who in a way is a descendant of Edwin Fisher. Schiff cites as one of his mentors Alfred Brendel, who was a student of Fisher, and Schiff himself has spoken very fondly of some of Fisher's discoveries. Let's return to the subject of whether computers can compose like Bach. Emmy is short for Experiments in Musical Intelligence. It was designed by a professor, David Cope, and the fugue that you heard is fugue number 46 from what he calls the well-programmed clavier. Professor Cope is both a former music professor and an expert computer programmer and has gone on record as saying that he does believe that computers can create. In a certain way, it's disingenuous to say that the computer wrote the music. It's really co-composed by Professor Cope and the computer. He wrote in an article called The Well-Programmed Clavier Style in Computer Music Composition, quote, Readers might be wondering if Emmy represents more of an analysis tool than one for composition. The fact is, I often describe the program as a large database of human composed music upon which sits a smaller but robust analytical system that then feeds its information to a small composing program. Data is therefore most critical, analysis second, and composing third. Let's look at that second level, analysis. It may prove key to us. Analysis, as taught in schools, is almost always formal, descriptive, linear, reductionist, and misses the creative discovery made by the composer. It reminds me of something that a composition teacher of mine once said. 
He had attended at the University of Paris in the 1950s composition classes by the famous Olivier Messiaen. Messiaen took them through several analyses of Beethoven's Third Symphony from every possible viewpoint. And at the end of it he said, but what makes it a masterpiece? We don't know. Does that mean that the process of creating a masterpiece is unknowable? No, it does not. It may be unknowable to formal analysis, but not to reason. But you have to do the hard work of rediscovering for yourself the composer's actual creative breakthroughs. And that doesn't mean what you feel were his creative breakthroughs, but what they actually were. And that involves taking a stab at composition. Maybe you're not ready to write a fugue, but you certainly can attempt to write a canon. In doing so, at some point, you may run into problems that cannot be solved by a simple, formal application of the rules. You have to create something new. Hopefully, you should be delighted to find that it doesn't mean throwing the rules out the window. You will find that the same process of investigation of harmonic ordering that led to the rules also leads to something that supersedes the rules as a higher harmonic ordering. I think of the uh, Sermon on the Mount where Christ says, I come not to overthrow the law but to fulfill it. Doesn't turn the other cheek sound like it's overthrowing an eye for an eye and a tooth for tooth? But you can see it is fulfilling it when what the law has been seeking is a concept of justice. It may seem preposterous to compare advances in musical composition to something as profound as the Sermon on the Mount. But the similarity that I am getting at is how revolutionary advances in knowledge are generated. Could you program a computer, no matter how much data you fed into it, to make a revolution in the conception of justice, like the one that the Sermon on the Mount makes over the Ten Commandments? Could you program a computer to rather than merely imitating the styles of various composers, do what they did. Make a lawful revolution over their predecessors, whom they venerated, and make a revolution as they did to fulfill the work that their predecessors had done. Only advancing upon their works after the most detailed study. Compare a Beethoven double fugue sometime to a Bach double fugue. The former is generated lovingly out of a study of the latter. Yet my, what a different universe they occupy. In Professor Cope's analysis, has he made any attempt to program into the computer how one composer makes a lawful, loving revolution over another composer? How would you program that in? From what little I've read, and I acknowledge that this is one of his shorter articles, I see no indication that he is submitting anything other than the most formal analysis into the computer. I believe that computer programmers who seek to imitate composers on the computer will tend to feed the computer even more reductionist and linear forms of analysis than what you would get in schools. How can I make that statement? Advocates of artificial intelligence who believe that computers can create as human beings create, even as genii create, have to, must, by necessity, ipso facto, have an extremely reductionist and mechanistic conception of how it is that human beings actually create. Otherwise, if they had any actual conception of what human beings actually do when being creative, they would ridicule the idea that a computer can create. As well, they are extremely limited by what their computers can process. One of the things Professor Cope resorts to is what he calls signatures. You find a passage in one piece by Bach and find a passage in another piece by Bach which is very similar in terms of things like rhythm, harmony, etc. This then, this signature is fed into the computer to give it a better sense of Bach's style. The poor computer is then supposed to have a better idea of how to compose like Bach. So, in a certain way, this whole question of computers composing is a giant tautology. A tautology in logic is a circular argument that just goes round and round. An example. Everything in the Bible is true. Well, how do you know that? Because it's the Word of God. 
Well, how do you know it's the Word of God? Because it's in the Bible. You know the next step, you can go all day. The music that the computer will produce cannot be any better than, and likely not as good as, the analysis fed into it, and thus a tautology. Why is computer music so boring, predictable, linear, and mechanical? Because it's basing its compositions on analysis, which is boring, predictable, linear, and mechanical. Well, why program it that way? One, because linear analysis, which can never understand the creative principle, is for the most part the only analysis available. And two, that's the only type of analysis your computer can work with. It is, after all, a computer. But let's not leave it at that. Let's examine for a bit the actual product of the computer and compare it to the actual product of Johann Sebastian Bach and see if we don't find the same difference between textbook stultification and actual creativity. I will play on the piano the first voice of the computer-generated fugue up to the point of the entrance of the second voice uh, as it is written in the uh, tenor voice. Notice how little harmonic tension it generates. Now I will play Bach's opening statement of the subject in the soprano voice. And you can already hear a difference. Both fugues are in B-flat minor, and Emmy's opening subject takes a B-flat minor triad, or chord, B-flat, D-flat, F, and creates the subject by unfolding that chord. Look in any textbook, and you will find that the way to generate a theme or subject is the unfolding of a triad, or chord. Since three notes would get boring over and over again to form a theme, you need what are known as passing tones and neighbor notes uh, to bridge those tones. At least one textbook I know of refers to passing tones and neighbor notes as, quote, non-essential tones. In other words, the essential tones are those three notes of the triad, and the others are just things that link them together. Try composing that way sometime, and see how fast you paint yourself into a corner. Listen again to Emmy's opening theme and hear it as the unfolding of a triad with passing tones and neighbor notes. Now, listen to just the first three notes of Emmy's fugue. Those notes, B flat, F, and D flat, are the three tones of a B flat minor triad. Listen to Bach's first three notes. That is a dissonant interval, a minor ninth. It is a huge leap from F to G flat, and in vocal terms, it is a register shift. The soprano voice has to change registers in order to sing that tone. The rest between F and G flat, a minor ninth higher, only serves to accentuate and facilitate the listener's hearing in a piece played on the keyboard the idea of a soprano voice changing register. That rest is vocal in its origin. Is there anything that you could program into Emmy that would cause it to generate something as simple? as that quarter note rest. That change of register from F to G flat, a minor ninth above, would not work the same in another key. The keys are very specific to these qualities of the human voice. Do computer programmers who wish to program a computer to compose like Bach feed the various registral qualities of the different species of human voice and how those registral vocal qualities behave differently in different keys into their analytical program? I doubt it. Now I will play the first two voices of Emmy's Fugue up to the point of entry of the third voice. 
I'm going to slow it down to box speed so you can compare them better. Uh, notice how you have a steady march of quarter notes. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. And they often proceed in parallel intervals such as parallel thirds or parallel sixths and really don't generate a lot of harmonic tension. Emmy is not being very imaginative here. And now I will play box opening two voices again up to the point of entry of the third voice. The differences are too great to even list. But I'll point out one thing. In Bach you hear something that addresses something seated deep in your memory. Between the completion of the second voice and the entry of the third voice, Bach introduces something new. First in the soprano voice. but it's also in the alto voice. And those two voices play that idea in canon. Is this just some arbitrary figuration that Bach introduced to get us from one place to another? Listen to the opening measures of the prelude that precedes this fugue. When you hear the soprano and alto voices of the fugue, as I played them just before that, some level of your memory, even if it's not conscious memory, is going to be measuring that against especially the rhythmic motif of that opening prelude. You don't know how many theoreticians insist that the preludes in the well-tempered clavier have nothing to do with their accompanying fugues. The fugues really don't derive from the preludes. Why are the preludes there then? Just out of custom? Now that might make a good idea for a signature, except that you're not just comparing two passages that sound the same. You're tracing an, an idea, the evolution of an idea. And the mind, in listening to the opening measures of the fugue, is not just hearing what's going on at that moment. It is hearing it from the standpoint of the entire process of development that led you up to that point. If you can turn that into a signature, good luck. We have only scratched the surface here. We have not examined why there is no pattern, no template, no cookie cutter for a Bach fuel. Listen to what Bach's first biographer, Forkel, had to say about this. In speaking of fugues written by Bach's contemporaries, he says, quote, In fugues of the ordinary kind, there is nothing but a certain very insignificant and sloppy routine. They take a theme, give it a companion, transpose both gradually into the keys related to the original one, and make the other parts accompany them in all these transpositions. This is a few, but of what kind? I would answer Forkel, the textbook kind, and the computer kind. In accounting for what makes box fugues different, he writes, Each has its own precisely defined character, and dependent upon that, 
its own turns in melody and harmony. When we know and can perform one, we really know only one, and can perform but one. Whereas we know and can play whole folios of fugues by other composers of Bach's time. As soon as we have comprehended and rendered familiar to our hand the turns of a single one. How about that? You know one few by one of Bach's contemporaries and you know them all. And maybe you could program it into a computer. You know one few by Bach? You know one few. That's it. But even that doesn't go far enough. The 20th century music theorist Heinrich Schenker in his analysis of the C minor fugue from Book One of the Well-Tempered Clavier wrote that every Bach fugue has its own law. When listening to an organist present a fugue of his own invention, Bach and his son Emmanuel would, after hearing the opening subject, whisper to each other that if this guy were any good, he would put the fugue through this, this, and that transformation. They could hear that the subject itself lent itself to such transformations. One subject may lend itself to multiple overlapping of entrances of the themes, another to none at all. One may lend itself to diminution and inversion, others not so. The fugue subject itself has properties that correspond to a sort of musical geometry, which pose a paradox, pose a puzzle, a problem to be resolved. The solution to that problem is nothing less than the entire working out the fugue as a whole. And thus, of course, every fugue has to have its own law. Of course, every fugue has to be different because the problems posed by each fugue subject are unique and require a different creative solution. You want a signature for Bach? Don't just look at commonality of passages. Try to find the commonality of the creative approach of problem solving to fugues of a completely different nature. If you can do that, then you might have a signature. Again, I wish you all the luck in the world. You're going to need it. A last word on the attempt of theory to define fugues according to a formula. While Bach was universally worshipped by theorists as the supreme master, the supreme model for fugue writing, he was nevertheless denounced as writing contrary to the rules. English theorist Ebenezer Prout wrote in 1891, There is probably no branch of musical composition in which theory is more widely, one might almost say hopelessly, at variance with practice. Theorists attempted to create many categories of fugue, all based on what they observed in Bach fugues, but to their dismay found that not a single Bach fugue fit into any of their categories which were supposedly based on Bach. Quite a defeat. The theorists resorted to a desperate measure. They could only write textbooks about fugue if they banned Bach. So they did. There were many textbooks on fugue written at that time, and I've seen many of them, in which all of the contrapuntal examples are written by the author of the textbook with no quotation of actual composition. So, in closing, if you want to know the difference between Bach and a computer, or Bach and a professor, you have to get your hands dirty, as they say. You have to do the work and examine the minutiae, but on doing that, you'll find the difference is very simple. Bach is a creative human being. No more and no less.